Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Today, we have Felicity joining us to share her story of assault at the hands of facial abuse, who we would consider one of the most dangerous porn companies on the internet today. She's been a bold advocate in the fight to end teen porn and even joined us for an end teen porn protest in Hollywood. I started shooting at 19 years old. I was sexually assaulted on set, blacklisted, and I felt trapped since the very beginning. As Felicity will be bravely sharing about the sexual assault that she endured, please bear in mind that this episode comes with a trigger warning and listener discretion is advised. So we got connected around a protest that we were doing up in Los Angeles, protesting the barely legal genre of pornography. And I was so struck by your story and your history with the porn industry and would love to ask you about, well, a few things, but um, specifically this company, Facial Abuse, uh, is a company that has a pattern and a history of I don't even know how to describe it, but uh, I don't even want to say pushing the boundaries because it feels like the genre and model of porn that they're doing is criminal. And I'm very curious to hear about your story and perspective of this more abusive genre of pornography. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, So I was contacted by Helen Uh, years ago after I spoke out, um, made a YouTube video talking about my experience with abusive porn sites, specifically facial abuse. Helen, by the way, for our listeners, is our vice president of Impact and Exodus Cry. So, Yeah. So I I think it was four years ago, I made a YouTube video and it did really well. It kind of, I don't want to use the word viral, but it got hundreds of thousands of views like on YouTube. And then also I uploaded it to tube sites like Pornhub and X videos, just because I knew it was kind of controversial to (laughs) upload a video like that, like on a porn site, but I knew people would see it. So it was just a way to kind of reach the people actually consuming porn, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. to change their perspective on what it's actually like to be in that industry. And yeah, I mean, I'm 31 now. Um, I got involved in porn when I was 20 and I've had a really rough journey like throughout the whole porn industry and the videos I made publicly have been not trashing porn, but sort of just providing real insight about what it's like to be a performer and just the hardship that's associated with it. I mean, everyone thinks that porn is like this really glamorous thing and it's fun and, you know, we're, we're looked at as almost like these celebrity type of actresses, but it's really dark and there's a lot of really messed up things that go in the porn industry and um, specifically like some of the type of porn that's out there, like abusive porn. It's very confusing to navigate through it because people sort of look at it as just another genre like BDSM or, oh, it's just acting. But a lot of it's real abuse and the aftermath is really difficult, I think, for people to get over. It has a lot of um, negative mental effects on you, you know, and then just realizing like, oh, wow, you know, what did I just do? Um, Why did I decide to do this? And a lot of young girls are just pressured and pushed to get out of their boundaries and to just shoot porn that has a lot of shock value because it's going to make you more famous, you know, and there's a lot of pressure from agents and just the industry in general to just go beyond what you're comfortable with. And when you're that young and vulnerable, I don't think people realize like you don't know what you're really doing at that age. And I didn't like I was pretty young and there was no roadmap um, to navigate through the industry. Like there's not really any real help from people telling you like, oh, this is the right move to do for your career. You know, you're just kind of thrown in it. And the idea of like modeling and doing that type of content, it's you get lost, you know, and Mm. you just feel like, oh, what should I do? What's going to help me grow my social media following? Um, And so uh, I was 20 and I was living on Long Island and 
facial abuse, they're based out of New Jersey. And um, I got approached on Twitter by some random account claiming that they were an agency, like a talent agency. And they said that this company, um, you know, they're extreme. They have, it's it's a BDSM type site, you know, but if you shoot this type of content, you're going to blow up. Like you're so pretty, you know, if you shoot something like this, it's going to help your career. And um, I was really naive and I was trying to just pay my way out to get to LA and move out of Long Island, you know, and start my career. And um, I looked at the company, the website, and I saw like what they were doing. And I really was struck. I was just shocked that this type of content was out there. And I'm not really sure like why I thought it would be a good idea. I think I was just very vulnerable and and thinking like, oh, this, this might help me. Like it's, it, people are going to see this and just, yeah, I was a little curious sexually too, to explore that type of experience. Um, and I think these companies know that, like they know girls at this age are really vulnerable and um, open to maybe exploring their sexuality. And they kind of jump on that. Like they jump on the idea of uh, getting girls to shoot things, to push themselves, you know, outside of their comfort zone. So I decided to talk to them. Um, and on the outside, like they, they seemed very friendly. Like they seemed like they were trying to be helpful. I spoke to, I guess, one of the owners and he told me, you know, what I would be doing for the site. And like I said before, I, I was familiar with their content. Like I wasn't blind going into it. Like I realized like, okay, like I'm going to be shooting some extreme porn and it's throat f-ing. like, that's kind of what it is. It's like, deep throat blow job to like you get to the point where they want you to throw up and I had never shot that type of porn before so yeah um to this day like I'm still I don't want to say regretful but I wish I had thought more about like what I was actually doing you know and um because before that I had only shot for two companies and they were very amateur based. Uh, it was girls do porn and exploited college girls. And those videos for me, I guess did kind of well, but, um, they were sort of just vanilla, like basic type of scenes, you know? So I thought like if I went down the route of shooting something more extreme, it would, uh, just expedite like my growth in, in porn and like continue to make my name bigger. So yeah, that was sort of why I decided to shoot for the company. Um, but yeah, I was in, just at a very lost stage in, in life, like trying to figure out, like I have these scenes under my belt, like how am I gonna keep progressing? And I decided to shoot for them the first time and um, I'm on the way to facial abuse. I took a train from Manhattan to New Jersey at their studio and uh, I got there and they treated me very, I guess you could say normal. Like it seemed like a normal set. Like they had a decent studio. Um, They treated me very kindly. Uh, I only met one of the owners and I met the other male performers there and they seemed very normal. Like everything seemed fine. Like I wasn't, I I didn't really feel uncomfortable. Um, And then leading up to the before shooting, um, they sat me down and I went through uh, almost like a checklist about like what I was kind of comfortable with, what I wasn't. And then with the director who I think he goes by hooligan. um, Sorry, it's it's been so long. Like some of the details like going into the shooter are are blurry. Um, But yeah, so we had sort of like a pre-shoot interview, like basically them telling me, okay, you know, we're going to be treating you a certain way on camera, but just know like this is acting. We're just getting into character. And so I was aware of what was going to happen. Like, and I've been clear with that. Like people called me a hypocrite for saying like, oh, she knew what she was getting herself into. Like she's not a victim, but that wasn't the reason why I was speaking out against this company. And I'll get to like the main reason I spoke out was more of the aftermath about what happened like after shooting with them. Um, so we go through like the whole pre- the preparation of shooting and everything. And um, 
we sort of just jumped into it. And once the camera started rolling, like I realized like, oh, shit, this is actually real. Like, you know, it wasn't, there's this really blurry thing that happens like when you're shooting that type of porn because like, you know, okay, this is a shoot. And if I want to stop, all I have to do is kind of say like, okay, you know, cut, stop, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. But when it actually starts rolling, like for this type of site, it, everything just gets real. I mean, the slapping, like it was real slaps. Like it was just mm -hmm. extreme, you know, and just watching videos before going on. I guess I wasn't really mentally prepared about like how real it was going to be. Um, so once it started, um, the first thing that really was the most uncomfortable thing was they try to humiliate you. Like they literally like want you to admit things on camera and embarrass you because it's degradation. Like that's like the whole point of the site. And it doesn't, it, it's hard because like, it doesn't really feel like, oh, this is BDSM. Like this is just a type of porn. It's that site is literal degradation. Like they want to embarrass women and make them feel like worthless. Um, and they sort of told me like they were gonna make fun of me and make me feel like a terrible person and this and that. But one of the first questions they asked me like when the camera was rolling is if I ever got touched by a family member, um, you know, and, and fortunately like I've had a good upbringing and I didn't have anything to say or admit on camera, but they didn't really prepare me for something like that. Like they were literally trying to get me to admit something that was so personal, uh, personal and vulnerable. And I was very sort of innocent when I was on camera and I just sort of was like a deer in headlights. Like, no, you know, I, I have a good upbringing. Like they couldn't really pull anything out of me. Um, and I think that frustrated them and it made them um, push harder, you know, and like want to break me down in the video. Like that's what they want to do. They want to break women down. And you can't really be mentally prepared for that. Like, you know, like even though they tell people, oh, like this is, we're just going to try to humiliate you. Like they don't really explain the, cons like the actual effect that's gonna have on you mentally once that camera's rolling. And they know that, like they're gonna put the camera in the woman's face and just overwhelm them with the fact that like, oh, you're being filmed. And one of the things like I really realized was when you're in that position and there's a camera this close to your face and you're technically going to be getting paid, it's a job, you want to do well. Like it's a, it's, you want to be an actress, but it's very confusing because you don't realize actually what they're doing. Like they're manipulating you on camera to just say the most terrible personal things and they're capturing that on video and then they're going to make fun of you. Um, and so a lot of the videos with other women, like they're admitting really personal things on camera that is actually detrimental, like down the road. You don't realize like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that on camera. And then this company knows like that they're doing that to women. Um, so that was a very strange experience. And then once the actual scene started where we're getting physical, um, one of the first things I remember was just sort of, them telling me to get on my knees and then just the slapping. Um, and then the first part, and I'm sorry, this is so graphic, but yeah. it's just, this is what like, yeah. happens on this yeah. type of porn site. Um, and the first part, like the segment with like just blowjob and before the sex, like it just is this, it's so extreme and like you don't realize um, how intense it actually is until you're in it. So that kind of happens. And then like once the sex started, um, it was just uh, a little overwhelming, but I wanted to do a good job, you know, because I also realized with this site um, and a lot of women have had um, issues with and not to get on a different topic, but I wanted to also say this. Um, I worked with a journalist Paul, uh, Paul Mulholland, um, who published an article like about facial abuse. And he interviewed many other women, like besides me, I'm just one actress that worked with them. And um, basically them saying, you know, a big reason they were so scared about not finishing the scene was um, they wouldn't pay you. 
Like, you know, that was a big thing back in the day with porn sites. Like there was like a kill fee or if you walked off set, you didn't want to finish the scene, you wouldn't get paid. So there was also a lot of pressure too, I think, for women performers to do the scene. Like once you're in it, you realize like, oh, shit, like I don't even want to do this, but you feel like you have to finish it because they'll just make fun of you in the video and then you won't even get paid, you know? And that happened. There was literal videos with facial abuse of women that like, didn't want to finish the scene and realize like, oh my God, I can't go through with this. And then they'll literally film you walking off set, making fun of you, and then you don't get a paycheck. Um, so I just, I think that's horrible, like the way they treated certain performers. Um, and then, you know, they, they still have these uh, pre-shoot interviews like with, with me, you know, that they've, they've published pre-shoot interviews with me, like basically saying like, oh, look, she's, she's a complete hypocrite. Like she spoke out against us, but there's clear evidence that she knew what she was getting herself into. But, um, at 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's just like, I hate to sound so harsh, but you don't really know what you're doing at 20 years old, you know, and this is also, to say the the legal thing that when we did the protest, um, I've also spoken out about the legal age of porn. Like 18 is just too young. Like it should be 21 because you really don't know what you're doing at that age. Like you're lost, you're confused. And I was, like I clearly was. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, you can be 18 and go into the military. Like you should be able to be 18 and shoot porn. But pornography is such it's such a crazy industry and people get into it so young and then down the road they realize, oh my God, you know, like, why did I do this? You know, I was impulsive and the, the industry knows women are that vulnerable at that age and they take advantage of you. And then they sort of just latch onto you forever and you're kind of stuck in it. The porn industry is a trap, you know, like once you get involved in the industry, like they'll just use you. And um, I don't think a lot of girls understand that at that age. And then it's just like they have to deal with the aftermath down the road. Um, and so back to facial abuse. Sorry, I'm a little um, all over the place. No, There's it's interesting to hear you kind of lay all that out. And I just yeah. think that when I listen to you talk, it sounds like you are trying to qualify your experience based on some of the accusations they have made against you. Like okay, I agreed to certain things. Yes, there was a pre-interview, whatever, whatever. And I appreciate that, but um, this is not like, this is not a normal situation. I think that those kind of like conversations from their perspective has more to do with basically how can we get away with this otherwise extremely criminal behavior. Yeah. And so predators work out very sophisticated, coercive, manipulative means for achieving their objectives and goals. Yeah. So when you take these like seasoned predators, right, and deploy them on vulnerable 20 year old girls and younger sometimes younger yeah who are really just kind of like exploring the world for the first time like what am i who am i going to be in this world what am i going to do in this world it's very normal for us as humans to want to try things on to be curious about things especially something as prominent as pornography has become in our world of course there's going to be um, some people who are curious about that so to prey on that vulnerability and sort of push them through a scenario whereby they can get the legal qualifications met is not a fair way to then say, oh, well, look, this person just really wanted this and they knew everything that was going on. Like, we're not talking about a... a, a mutually um we're not talking about a situation that was built through mutuality it's not like we sat down i was like hey what are the kind of things that you like what do i like and we're checking in with each other and there's like there's that sensitivity and mutuality and empathy around that no this is like they have an agenda you have some idea of what it might involve and then when it's invoked there's another thing of like 
the energy that's involved in that, the psychology behind it. There's like so much more that is happening in a violent encounter like that than just like, oh, you're doing what you said you were going to do. And so I think that part of what people need to understand is like the larger framework around situations like this. These people are cyber bullies that want to capture a girl in her worst, most humiliating moment and then forever use that to blackmail her into silence about the crimes that happened to her body. And then if you have, when you have like people who are already looking for an excuse to want to watch this, like, well, she really wanted it or, you know, whatever that cover narrative they want to create is, they're not doing a lot of like deep thinking about the larger framework through which these ex encounters and experiences happened. And so part of my interest in having conversations like this is really helping to educate our audience that guys, just because you saw a, a pre-interview, it appeared the person knew what was going on, or just because it appears that this is consensual, whatever, like don't let that color your entire experience of sites that are um, obsessed with this abusive uh, uh, genre of pornography. And we need to be better educated about all the dynamics, the human biopsychosocial dynamics going on in a situation like that, that a girl would end up, would end up in this situation. Yeah. And so for my part, it's a lot easier for me to do the math on like, oh, I completely understand how you would experience something like that as like very abusive. I don't personally feel like I need all those qualifiers, but I'm glad that you're mentioning them because that is the ammunition that's used against you. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would be curious for you to further elaborate on like on your experience. Um, like I said, just to continue to help educate people on uh, the full experience of what of what's going on in a situation like this, because there is a genre, this abusive genre of pornography that has gotten a pass um, for all these years. But in that genre, there are horrible things happening. And I think it's really important for people to understand the yeah. nature of that. Yeah. You, thank you for explaining a little bit more. Um, I, you're so dead on. Um, it's super convoluted. Like it, it, It's really confusing to explain what the experience is like on camera and then the aftermath because they're trying to get away with this idea that, oh, this is acting, like this is okay, like she's consenting. But they don't explain what it's actually like when you're in the midst of it and what they're doing, like I said before, like they're trying to just get the women to do the most crazy things on camera because there's this pressure like once the camera's rolling it's confusing like you want to do a good job you want to get your paycheck and then once you're in that position you sort of realize oh shit you know like what am I doing like what's going to happen down the road um, and the way they go after women um, if you you know on, on their site like I was saying before there, there's a lot of racist things that's going on the Latino category the ghetto gaggers and a lot of these women um not to sound harsh but some of them are clearly prostitutes they're drug addicts like you can see these women are coming from broken homes or they might be in terrible positions and they know that and like they want to take advantage of women that are in really bad places in life and the thing with me, which is why I think the company, the owners have been, or the one owner Duke has been so obsessed with me is because I was one of the more attractive women on the site that clearly like had a lot of other things going for me in life. Like I didn't come from a bad family. I'm, you know, went to college, I'm a drummer, I work in nutrition, like I had all these other things. So to them, it was sort of fascinating, like, wow, like how did a woman like that end up on this site, right? Um, but it's because like I had shot for a couple of companies and they knew that I was very early on in my porn career and obviously trying to get to the next step of being a bigger performer. So they thought, oh, you know, we're going to reach out to this woman and get her to shoot for this crazy site, making her think that this is going to be helpful to her career. And that's exactly what happened. Like I thought, okay, this is going to just make people this is going to gain more attention to me. Um, and I 
didn't really think, okay, actually, no, this is going to be probably devastating to my life long term. But once I was in that position where I was shooting for them, I felt like, okay, I have to go through with this. I'm here. I'm not going to get paid otherwise. Um, so when I'm actually on camera, like back to the actual shoot, um, once the actual scene was just going and the sex started and everything, my mindset was just, okay, like I have to get through this. Like I'm, I'm here, you know, I can't back out now. So I finished this scene and once it stopped, they sort of jumped like out of character again and were acting like my friend, you know, almost like, oh, wow, you did a great job. You know, like I was super just, sweet and calm and had really no complaints. Like I was trying to just act professional and um, do a good job, you know? And they were just realizing like, oh, this girl is just, she, she's just easy to, to, to manipulate, you know? And um, after I was just so confused, like thinking like, okay, I guess I did a good job. And I got my paycheck and they don't really check in on you after this scene. There was just this gap of time where I finished the scene and I don't know when it's gonna come out. And then once it did, it was very devastating for me mentally because once the scene actually came out and people started seeing it, I sort of realized like, oh my God, like I can't believe I actually did this. Um, and this was a similar feeling to the for after the first scene that I shot. Um, and I could go more in depth about like what it's like, you know, when you first get started in porn and, and the first scene comes out and everyone starts reacting to your decision. Um, I thought I made a huge mistake in the beginning of my porn career. Like once I shot for that amateur site, Girls Do Porn, which is now shut down because the owners got outed for sex trafficking and everything. And I was a part of that case. But once that first scene I did came out, um, I just realized like, oh, wow, okay, I'm gonna be associated with porn for the rest of my life, right? Like you kind of get pigeonholed. And I think a lot of girls, once they shoot their first scene in porn, they really do feel trapped. Like they feel like, oh my God, you know, this is going to be attached to my life. So I have to just kind of go with it. And so that's sort of what my mindset was. Like I thought I was an embarrassment. Like I, I thought, oh, sh um, this is going to be my life. So I got to make the most of it. And my friends and family, like it was, it was not an easy situation. Like it really was, uh, difficult to kind of deal with. Um, and sorry to jump back to get off topic again with the facial abuse, but I should note, like the reason I even got into porn was I was about 19. I was modeling, I was sort of exploring my sexuality and I got approached by this amateur company to shoot for girls do porn. And they only shot first timers and the girls were young on the site. Like they knew that they were approaching these young girls that were attractive and wanting to maybe start like a modeling or porn career. And they go after these young vulnerable women. So that's why I shot porn. Cause I was just wanting to maybe explore myself sexually and I was already doing some nude modeling and, um, you know, I ended up shooting for that site and I didn't shoot again for almost a year because I thought I did make a mistake, but I was getting so humiliated by people finding out that I thought like, okay, I should probably just embrace the fact that I shot porn and just make the most of it, you know? So back to the facial abuse thing, after that video came out, I my mental health was kind of going a little bit downhill. Like I was really at a bad place. Um, I kind of thought I made a huge mistake and I was just sort of trying to think like, what's my next move? Like, should I just completely back out of this whole world or should I just keep going and just say F it, you know, like I, I need to just figure this out. Um, and around that time, a few other things were happening in my life uh, that sort of made me a little more positive. I got invited to go to AVNs for the first time. And I also got on um, the tattoo show Ink Master and I did a, um, an episode with them um, 
so I tried to stay more positive and think like, okay, I can maybe make the most of this whole porn career thing. Um, and when I went to AVNs, it was an interesting experience, like seeing all these other actresses or p p people in porn. And it almost made me think like, oh, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Um, I should just embrace this. And so that was what I was trying to do. I think there was a gap of time. I, I, it was less than a year. Um, and I got in contact with facial abuse again and they kept telling me, oh, you know, your scene did so good. Like you should shoot for us again. And this is the most confusing thing for me and people calling me a hypocrite is because I've spoke out against them, but then people say, oh, you know, I shot for them twice. So like, why is she acting like a victim when she shot for them a second time? And this is what people don't understand. It's like once you do shoot for a company like that, they they latch on to you and they almost make it seem like, well, you're not going to have any other options. So why don't you shoot for us again? And they were very manipulative, acting like, oh, you know, you were one of our best things. The scene did so good. Like, shoot for us again. And so I, I just wasn't sure. I thought maybe this would be a good idea to shoot for them again. I don't know, you know, and I did end up shooting for them again. And it was the same sort of experience. Like they were just, it, it was extreme. I was just trying to do a good job. Um, and I shot for this offsite that they also do that isn't really abusive. It was more of like a normal blowjob scene. And I think they were just trying to normalize the whole experience for me and make it seem like this isn't bad what you're doing. But they just knew that I was in a very vulnerable point in my life, like trying to make the most of my last decision. And when I've made the YouTube video, like talking about abusive porn, this is what I was trying to get across to people is that these, these young people that shoot for extreme sites like this, you're just kind of making the most of a decision. And you know, people make mistakes in life and they regret things that they do. And then they try to grow forward. And that's what I was trying to do. But I just felt like, okay, like these people, like were trying to act like my friends, like they were on my side. So I just thought like, I'll shoot for them again. So after I shot for them a second time, this is when things got very confusing. And, and the owner of the company, Duke, he reached out to me and he offered to work with me on a bigger capacity and build a pay site for me. And at this point, the idea of like having my own website seemed enticing, right? Like I'm like, oh, I could actually make money, you know, and this person sees potential in me. And he wanted to work with me, like just a one-on-one -on -one thing, like where he would do the back end of building a site and I would just have to shoot content. And he was kind of just obsessed with me, like fascinated with just why a girl like me would want to shoot for them. And he was trying to act like he was supporting me and helping me. And um, he was basically being a predator. And this was the first time that I had ever actually interacted with him because before that it was just with the other owner, Ernie. And um, so I just thought, oh, wow, like this person's gonna maybe help me. And I was just so naive at this age. Like, I don't know how else to say it. I was so naive and he knew that. Like I didn't have the guidance or anything because back in the day, especially 10 years ago, you know, before the Me Too movement, before sites like OnlyFans came out where it's supporting independent content creators, the porn industry was a wild west. Like there was no roadmap. Like there was no way to navigate it like you were just kind of thrown into it and like these agencies and porn there's a lot of just haziness that goes on like a lot of the agents are super sketchy like it's not really a real talent agency I mean they're trying to be more legitimate now but back then like there was a lot of sketchy characters posing as agents that were really just trying to push girls into doing things that weren't actually healthy, like escorting or, or seeing private clients, things like that. Um, so Duke was trying to make it appear like he was my friend. And um, he was like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll buy 
I'll, I'll buy camera equipment. I'll do this. You know, he's like, we should get the domain felicityfeline.com. And at the time, like, I didn't know how to even buy a domain. I mean, it's like embarrassing to even <laughs> admit this, but I was just kind of clueless about the whole like building a website and all this stuff. So he bought the domain felicityfeline.com with the intention of like, he was going to build a site for me. And then I had some moments of clarity, like realizing, okay, like, is this really what I want to be doing? Like, do I want to be working with someone like this that owns a site like facial abuse and like is acting like he's going to help my career? Um, and I had a lot of hesitation. And then at the same time, I got approached by a few other companies in Los Angeles to shoot out there, um, Evil Angel and then Brazzers, like some bigger companies. And I realized, oh wow, like I'm getting offers to shoot with bigger companies. So I had a way to get to Los Angeles and start to actually make some money to sustain myself. But I was also taking some trips to Los Angeles back and forth around this time, like just kind of networking and getting my foot in that world to sort of move over there and get out of New York. And I ended up politely telling Duke, like, look, I'm, I'm actually not really interested in doing this. I'm getting offers to go to Los Angeles. Like I want to sort of get my career out there. So I, I'm not interested. And when I rejected his offer to work with him, that's when he got crazy and and started trying to, I guess, harm my career. And he built a um, a blog on felicityfeline.com, basically impersonating me and promoting his sites, like acting like this was me on the blog. And when I asked him to give me the domain back, he refused and said, well, if you work for me for free, I'll give it back to you. And he asked me to work um, expos for him, uh, like, you know, porn expos uh, that they have. I guess he wanted to get a booth at some of them and he wanted me to work at the booth, basically acting like I was representing facial abuse. And I just realized at this point, I was like, I no longer really wanted to be associated with this company. Like I was just like, oh my God, you know, like what, what, what was I thinking? What was I doing? And I just had a complete change of heart, like realizing I had a lot of other things going for me and like, wh why do I want to be associated with this company? Um, and he didn't like that. And um, ever since then, like he just refused to give the domain back and was basically blackmailing me. Um, and bullying me, cyberbullying, like became a complete cyberbully and started um, just on social media, like continuously making posts with me and facial abuse. And this is what these porn companies do. Like they latch on to women knowing that they're kind of stuck in this industry and they'll just use your name to grow their company forever. And there's no real benefits from the performer other than, you know, maybe you're getting some exposure online, but there's no royalties in porn. Like there's no health care. Like these companies don't give a shit about the welfare of performers, especially their mental health. And companies like facial abuse, these abusive sites, they don't give a crap about like the long-term effects about what it's going to have on your mental health. And a lot of these girls end up devastated. And like for me, fortunately, like I'm, you know, I come from a good family. I'm I'm healthy. I'm educated. Um, I have a good head on my shoulders. So I was able to sort of just push forward. But a lot of these young women like don't have that luxury and like they get, you know, involved in drugs or they go down really dark paths. Um, there's a few women that have committed suicide, like after working for facial abuse. And the journalist that I worked with, like he published this whole article, like talking in depth about just the long-term effects that it's had on performers. And this is what I was trying to really talk about in the YouTube videos that I made talking about abusive porn. And people want to act like, oh, these girls knew what they were doing. Like they signed up for it. Don't act like a victim. But they're missing the point. You know, like people are so susceptible at these young ages to make impulsive decisions. You know, I mean, there's people that go to prison for stealing or, or killing people or, you know, some women that are just 
vulnerable and want to do modeling or get pushed into doing sex work, they're just trying to make the most out of their life and make money, you know, and, and these people in porn know that they're vulnerable at these ages. And it's confusing. Like you make decisions that you regret um, and then you sort of get stuck and you just try to make the most of your decision. Um, but people don't talk about like the long term health effects for performers. So that's why I've been like an advocate for speaking out against abusive porn, because people just need to be more informed of like the effects that it's going to have on you long term. And people shouldn't be consuming this type of pornography because like it's really confusing about, you know, what's healthy in sex? Like why are people attracted to people getting abused sexually? In just a few decades, porn has invaded the screens of nearly every household with an internet connection. But few people know the truth about the multi-billion dollar industry behind this content. Action. Our documentary miniseries Beyond Fantasy rips the mask off of the porn industry. It takes viewers straight into the belly of the beast and brings them face to face with some of the biggest porn producers and performers as they describe, in their own words, an industry that profits from ethical violation, coercion and abuse. The chances, the risks that they take are the deal that they make with the devil when they come into this business. It's a hard-hitting series that exposes the porn industry like no other film, but keep in mind that it does include the use of blurred porn video clips, so we encourage viewer discretion. You can watch the Beyond Fantasy series for free on YouTube or at beyondfantasy.com. I think that, that people don't understand how a lot of the, like, the psychological dynamics of how dominant hierarchies, systems of trafficking, authoritarian arrangements, malevolent hierarchies work. And the, the system of mind control programming, brainwashing, manipulation, um, coerced consent, bribed consent, um, that goes along with this. And how confusing it can be for somebody in it. This is why it's so difficult for people to leave like these like really toxic situations like cults or it could be military regimes you know any ideologically based um uh system and so i want to just kind of reflect back to you some of my own kind of like perspective is like you're sharing these things is like first of all the idea of coerced consent i think is important to understand that um, consent is such a low bar for, um, for something as vulnerable as sexual intimacy and connection and just sexual intercourse in general, because consent can be bribed, it can be coerced, it can be manipulated. And, um, and so just the fragility of being through in a transitional stage of life and sort of like trying on different things in the world like to be in that stage and then to be sort of preyed upon from people who are serial predators yeah. um there's not equal footing there uh, like one pimp said i eat sleep think breathe you know drink um thinking of ways to get these girls to do what I want. They have no chance against a guy like me. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody whose mindset is so thought through and so developed on how to prey upon vulnerabilities, like it's not, there's an imbalance of power, an imbalance of life experience, an imbalance of economics, an imbalance on so many levels. And that imbalance becomes exploited. Yeah. And then in the situation where the exploitation is happening, which it's impossible to film one of these scenes and for there not to be an exploitation that happens. Yeah. Um, international law states that you cannot consent to your own torture. And, um, and what is invoked in these sexual scenes, both verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually, is abusive just straight up. 
I mean, it is literally called abuse porn. It's literally called facial abuse. But then a trauma bond happens. And that's another thing that people don't understand is that dynamic of like, I was subjected to something that was so like visceral. Like the, we experience violence as something very visceral. And, um, and so it, it fractures the nature of like what might be like a normal relationship with that person. There's some barrier that's removed there. And so the natural kind of tendency as humans is to bond to that person who has violated me or invoked violence on me or um, subjected me to some kind of torture or physical or sexual abuse to bond to them for my own safety. Yes. Well, if yeah. I'm kind to them, if I sort of align myself with them, then I'll get some, it'll soothe this fear and anxiety and trauma that's that's been invoked on me. So I think these psychological observations help explain some of, I think, what you sound like you were going through in this situation. Yeah, at such a young and, age. At such a young age. And the last thing that I wanted to say, just to reflect back to you, is sort of like framing a bit of your like experience in porn is just the general zeitgeist that one enters when you come into this space. So for somebody who kind of reconciles to themselves, like, well, maybe this is something I'll explore. Once you're past that point, then your brain quickly goes to, okay, well, mentally I've, I'm, I'm making this choice. So then how do I thrive in the context of this choice? And so in the zeitgeist of porn, there's this consciousness of like a certain idea that is like presented and like talked about. It's just in the air of like, oh, well, you need to do this or you need to do this or you need to do that. And so there's a lot of like forces, like forces of energy that are moving people towards things that they might otherwise not be moved towards or that won't be in their best interest or good for their health or because it's like, well, this is how you ascend in this. And so, um, so in sports, maybe that's helpful. Like, well, if I throw a certain amount of touchdowns, you know, there's like certain, but in porn, it's like, well, if it's all about crossing boundaries, it's all about crossing personal barriers. So it's like, well, I wouldn't think that I'd do this, but if that's how I make it, maybe I should do that. So in my observation, like, and, and having talked with dozens of survivors of porn, the entire system operates as a predatory system of brainwashing, control, manipulation, and exploitation. All the power belongs to the gatekeepers of this industry their agenda is like this grinding wheel and and it's luring people into it who get ground up and spit out and then told well you signed a consent form it's all on you absolutely and and then you have this audience of people who are masturbating to this content they don't want to accept kind of the vulnerability and shame of their own participation and complicity with this so they are motivated to accept the cover narrative that this was all consensual and it creates this whole vicious toxic system. Yep. And so I really appreciate you speaking out about this because while I can tell you're like still finding language and 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 wrestling through a lot of the confusion of your own experience, it takes a lot of courage to be able to say something was wrong here. Like you're, you're told one thing like, Oh, this was your fault. You were consented this blah, blah, blah. But it's another thing to find the courage to say, I know that something was wrong, even though I can't fully describe or explain what that is. And so I think like having conversations like this are helpful because I have an outside view and like, even though I'm not a psychologist, I have enough of an understanding of how cults work and military regimes and, you know, polarized political situations. I've studied a lot of this to understand those mind control programming dynamics to see like quite obviously how those things are at work in this industry and how easy it could be for a young person who is at a more vulnerable stage of life to be 
seduced into that and then to have their consent bribed. And I think that in the context of having this conversation, my hope is that it will shed some light on this genre of pornography that is surrounded by a lot of confusion and yeah. that's producing a lot of harm in people's lives, resulting in some cases even in suicide. Yeah. I mean, for both performers, but also the people consuming it. Because like you said, you know, there's a lot of, I think, shame associated with people that even watch this type of porn because it's for me, like I've thought a lot about it over the years. Like, why are people attracted to fetishes? You know, like, why are they attracted to extreme porn? It's because they're curious about their sexuality. Like people are trying to explore like what really excites them. And then, you know, like, why am I even attracted to this? And a lot of young women specifically, like they're, they're, they're confused at these points in their life. And they think like, oh, like I'm just exploring my sexuality. You know, it's like, why are people into things like choking and slapping? Like, why is that even a thing? People, but people are just exploring their, their boundaries and, and things like that. And these companies know that. And like, they want to get women to do things on camera and capture that. And then it's just benefiting their site, but they're not thinking long term, like, what is this going to do to this woman's mental health? Like after this stuff is out, when you were talking about the trauma bonding, this is such a good thing to bring up because I've thought about this a lot too, about, I sort of associate like abusive sites, like facial abuse, like an abusive boyfriend, right? Like that's kind of essentially like what they're doing. Like they're making it seem like, oh, like, you know, you're, you're pushing your boundaries, but we're actually your friend, you know? And so women like attach this vulnerability to these people thinking like, oh, they're actually not bad people, but in reality they are because they're just getting women to do things that maybe they normally wouldn't do in real life, or they would only do it with people that they trust in a, in a different environment. But these companies want you to just do the most crazy things on camera, thinking that it's going to help your career. Um, and Duke, you know, he's a predator, like he's an absolute predator. And it's like, why wouldn't he give me my domain back when I asked him? Like, why would he make a fake blog trashing me? Is that still to this day? Or? Yes. And it's like, I, I have a trademark on my name, felicityfeline.com. I mean, Felicity Feline. And he's literally been running this site, operating it. And I've asked so many times for him to give it back. And he's just literally blackmailed me saying like, oh, well, if you work for me for free, I'll give it back to you. Or, you know, he's going to maybe hold it until I pay him a certain amount or something like that. And he's literally saying, oh, you know, your trademark doesn't mean anything. Like, that's, you know, you signed consent to work with us. And he's been a complete cyber bully like for almost 10 years, you know, it's like, how can someone sleep at night knowing that they're doing this to a performer um, that was only just at a lost vulnerable point in her life at such a young age. And as I've tried to grow over the years and shift out and transition out of porn, you know, working as a drummer, working as a nutrition coach, working as a yoga instructor, like trying to move forward with my life, he continues to just attach his his company to my name, almost making it seem like, oh, well, you're always going to be facial abuse. Like that's what people are just going to always recognize you for. And then also acting like I just shot for this company yesterday, even though it's almost 10 years ago. And like porn companies do that to performers. Like they'll literally latch onto their careers forever. And we don't get royalties, you know, and like they're not thinking long term, like how, like what is the performer gaining from that? Um, and a lot of people just don't know that. Like they don't realize like what is actually going on in the porn industry. It's not like a, a normal um, acting facility, you know, like there's no real protection for performers, you know, you have to pay out of pocket for healthcare. Like you have, if you're getting tested twice a month, you're paying out of pocket for that. I mean, these are things people just don't know. And they look at it as like, oh, it's this sort of glam glamorous industry to be a porn star, but it's not. And a lot of these women have such a short shelf life. And then, like you said, they're just chewed up and spit out. And there's always just that need for a new, young, fresh face. Like they're not thinking about like the longevity of what this woman is gonna have to do down the road. And a lot of women have trouble 
escaping the industry. And so they keep going back to it because, you know, once you sort of get associated with that industry, it is really hard to transition out of it. Um, and a lot of these women get involved in escorting or they just get bought out by a sugar daddy, but there's not like a real game plan that I think people think about when they get involved in porn. Like, and that, that's why there's such a short time span of working in the industry, you know, because you just, you get burnt out or a lot of these companies, like they are no longer interested in you after a year or maybe two years. It's like that's, that's a long period of time. A lot of it's just a short time. And if you don't continue to do things that are pushing your boundaries, like maybe you start out just doing like a girl boy scene, just regular sex, or, you know, maybe you're shooting like a girl girl scene. Sorry to be so graphic, but like, you know, you start just shooting basic stuff, but then companies get bored with you. Like there's always going to be other girls that are willing to do more crazy things than you. So then you get pushed to do anal, or then you get pushed to do double penetration or, you know, orgies or all these things. Like they're just trying to push performers to do as many crazy things as you can. And that's why some performers end up exploring things like BDSM or abusive porn because they think, oh, this is just going to get more views. It's going to get more people to just pay attention to me. But they don't realize like this is actually detrimental to their health, like mentally. Um, and that is why a lot of women like end up getting addicted to drugs or they end up in abusive relationships with agents or things like that. Um, totally. So yeah, this is why like I've spoken out against this because like you said, like the whole time I was involved in porn, like I realized a lot of messed up things that were going in, on in the industry and people are uncomfortable to talk about it because like you said, a lot of people like they're just, they're addicted to masturbation. They're watching porn all the time and they sort of just want to like jerk off and then close their laptop and forget about it. You right, know, right. And, like it, it, it seems like, oh, like watching porn and masturbation, like it's the normal thing, but that's a whole other thing. Like people are so addicted to porn and they normalize it, like thinking like, oh, everyone does it. But in reality, like it's actually not a very natural thing. Like why are people so addicted to watching this artificial stimulation, totally. you know? And I've spoken out a lot about that too, like people being addicted to porn. And I've just gotten bashed by people on the internet like talking about it and a lot of the these people bashing me are people that are addicted to porn and they don't want to admit their addiction you know but um no one talks about it and a lot of other performers like they don't want to talk about things like this because they don't want to be blacklisted and they don't want to deal with bullies harassing them on the internet and yeah like I've gotten a lot of harassment by people that watch facial abuse you know just making fun of me like always saying oh your best scenes were with facial abuse like you're always going to be associated with this company even though it happened o over eight years ago you know so well, sorry that was a mouthful no yeah but it, the impressions that i get from you are consistent with my own experience of investigating the porn industry which is that it's not a benign energy. It's not a neutral energy in the porn industry. It's not a welcoming space, even though like your motivation might have been curiosity about your own sexuality and like looking for a way to explore that. Like that's not, that's not the energy in the porn industry. There's a presentation of that narrative, but the deeper truth is that there's this malevolent, energy that is moving people towards certain ends in the porn industry yeah and it's all that that malevolent energy is embodied i believe spiritually it's embodied by the pornographers themselves the people who are making this content it's embodied by the agents it's embodied in the demands of the consumers it's embodied in the financial motivations behind the sites that are distributing this content like there's this malevolent energy that is moving people towards certain ends and mm -hmm. those ends always are the more extreme and there is like this um it's it's this energy that wants to 
take beauty, truth, goodness, purity, innocence, vulnerability, and violate and fracture it in the context of a sexual scenario on film so that a viewer at home can have this heady cocktail of an experience mm -hmm. of arousal. And but all of it is, is so damaging. Like, and so um somebody's, you know, beauty, purity, goodness, innocence, whatever could just be that like having a boundary around their sexuality. Like I'm only comfortable with, you know, vanilla sex, let's say. Um, or I'm only comfortable with a girl girl scenario. Let's just say as an example. So the idea of violating that would be this person who's only really comfortable with vanilla sex is now going to be participating in anal sex or fill in the blank, whatever other thing. And that, the, so that the whole industry operates as this like vicious malevolent energy that's mm -hmm. like moving people only comfortable here over here to feed to give people that heady wine at home who who need the novelty to have some kind of arousal and masturbatory experience to this content. And so I'm I'm just trying to reflect these things back to you because a big part of my interest in having this conversation is to illuminate a, a lot of the more psychological underpinnings and just the larger meta framework of the porn industry so that people at home will stop watching this and feel empowered to actually protest it yeah. and say like, this is not a safe place for people to explore their sexuality. We need to stop telling 18 year olds that this is a safe context to explore their sexuality. And it's not. Yeah. And totally for the people who maybe are making a more conscious choice, their subjectivity is not honored. It's not respected. It's not valued. It's not, they're not going to be escorted on a very sensitive, caring, empathetic journey through their sexuality and this. There are malevolent forces over this industry at work to send people into a blender of sexual violation. Yep. And um, and I think you're, and then, and then to shame them for it. Yeah. For the rest of their life. Like, Absolutely. And bully and shame and stigmatize them for the rest of their life for it, to punish them. Yeah. Like, how dare you? It, on one hand, it's we want to suck all the innocence out of you, right? But then on the other hand, when that happens, now we want to accuse you. Yeah. It's this horrible, awful, misogynistic, emotionally violent behavior, and it needs to end. Yeah, absolutely. You made so many good points. Um, it's almost like a shattering of innocence. Like that's essentially what it was. Like that's what these abusive porn sites like try to do. Like they they want to capture someone's innocence or their sexual curiosity and just exploit that. Um, and when I made that first YouTube video, the title was literally think twice about shooting abusive porn because it will have devastating effects for you down the road. And I'm a living example of that. And I wasn't, you know... It, I'm all about people making decisions that they want to do. Like it's your own life. Um, just think twice about it because a lot of times like the aftermath can really affect you long term. And then it's hard to navigate once it's already out there because these companies too, like once they own that content, it's out there forever. And I don't think a lot of performers think about that. Like they don't realize like you're no longer going to own this content. They can do whatever they want with it and you're not, benefiting from this. Yeah. Um, so that's why it was more of like a warning video for people, like just to, to see that. And over the years, I mean, as much as I've gotten bullied and harassed by people, I've also had countless people reach out to me and thank me like for making this video, like, wow, like you've changed my perspective on, on how I look at porn. You know, thank you for making this video. Or like young women have reached out to me saying like, I'm so happy I saw your video because now like, I'm no longer interested in trying to shoot porn or something. And there's there hasn't been too many porn performers like speaking out against it because everyone will call you a hypocrite or so that that's been difficult for me sometimes like facing the bullies and everything, but I know that like I'm doing the right thing by just trying to educate yeah. people, you know? Um 
And like you said, just a, a big thing too is it's very desensitizing, like the whole abusive porn and just porn in general. Like it's so desensitizing to people because the reason porn is so addictive is that there's this endless supply. Like there's this, you can literally go on a tube site and watch anything you want for free. And a lot of these young kids that are going on their phones and just watching porn, like it's creating such an unhealthy perspective of sexuality. Like it's literally making it seem like, oh, women want to be treated this way. Like, you know, it's, it's a normal thing to want to slap a woman or choke her or make her feel a certain way. And these young kids like think this is the way I should treat women um, or, you know, women to men. I mean, it goes both ways, but it's actually really, I think, detrimental like on how young men are creating relationships with women or they have these super unrealistic expectations about like what sex should be like or what beauty is. And it's, it's making just relationships with each other toxic, Totally, you know? And, um, that was another reason too, why I've always been supportive about raising the age of porn because porn is just so accessible. Like it's really scary actually, like how easy it is to just go on a tube site and just watch anything you want. Um, and the whole other thing that I've always thought was super weird that people are afraid to talk about um, or I've gotten a lot of backlash about is just why is there a category? And you guys did this in one of your documentaries. Like, why is there a category of barely legal? Like, like why are, why are people attracted to that? Like, why are we normalizing this fantasy about wanting, have, wanting to have sex with a girl that's underage? Like, I really think it's like creating this desire for pedophilia and like people don't want to talk about it because they're like, oh, they don't want to admit that they're watching this type of porn. But like, why are we normalizing that? Totally. You know, and so I was so happy to like march in that protest and talk about it, even though I knew I was going to get backlash. And I remember like seeing some of the comments because I made a video specifically like saying like raising the age from 18 to 21. Um, a lot of the backlash I got were comments of people saying, oh, you're just afraid that, you know, these younger people are are stealing your fire or something. And I was just thinking like, oh this isn't God. about jealousy. Like this is about yeah, promoting totally. like the reality that people are getting obsessed with like just this younger and younger thing, like thinking like this is okay, but it's taking innocence like out of young women to like have a normal life. Like everything is getting sexualized. You know, it's like, and it's just so graphic to think about these things with the, you know, th this is how over the years I've, I've thought about it. Like say like a woman, you know, in, in high school, like just changing in the locker room, porn takes these innocent situations and sexualizes everything. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like a woman just can't like have a, a gym class and change in a locker room. Like, why is it turning into these scenes? Like, oh, like Susie's young and innocent and exploring her sexuality with, you know, another girl. Like it, it's just creating these really weird fantasies for yeah. people. Um, sorry. Total, I'm, I'm, no, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, like, and in, in our investigation, we really had to kind of like narrow down, okay, what are the few things that we can really focus on? Because um, there's so many directions you can go. And that's a huge point that, you know, we weren't able to make the larger point in our docu-series, but it's so valuable. Like, if you enter that world, it's so novelty-based that getting a pizza delivery is sexually, literally everything. And so, if you are somebody who is consuming this content, how do you go about the world? Like, everything becomes a trigger. Yeah. And like, and so we wonder why we live in a world where there's such rampant sexual abuse. Um, well, like we're, we've created a world where everything is sexualized and women are turned into two-dimensional sex objects. So I think that's a really important point. For the sake of time, we do need to wrap this up, but there's, I wanted to just highlight this one thing is that, you know, I never know who's going to be listening to our podcast people who are creating this kind of content, there is a, still a path forward for them. And it is a path of repentance. It is a path of owning and facing and acknowledging your own predatory behavior and your own conscious and willful destruction of other human beings' lives. 
repenting of that and making restitution. That is the way forward. The sobriety that I feel for these people is that there is a reckoning coming. And I would hate to be a person who's in that position when that reckoning comes, because it is coming. We did a documentary about a guy named Max Hardcore. It's called Beyond Fantasy Hardcore. And this man was preying on vulnerable young women, abusing them in the most violent, horrific, degrading and humiliating ways, and then mocking them for it. When this documentary came out, he was hospitalized just hours later. And then a few days later was dead and um, from some illness. So I look at the timing of that. Me personally, I, <laughs> I feel so much sobriety about all of this. I'm like, if you are somebody who is participating in the systematic pred predation of young women, capturing on that camera, feeding it to other people, profiting from that, and then harassing and bullying and mocking and humiliating them. Like there is a reckoning coming. Yeah. And I think it's important to acknowledge that in a conversation like this, these, they will not get away with this behavior. And for my part, I am just grateful to talk to courageous people like yourself who are willing to have these conversations to help process your own experience and journey. And my hope for you is that you have a support system that really stands with you in all of this and that you can get the kind of support, emotional support, validation, everything that you need to continue to be a voice. Because I know firsthand how, um, how damaging the backlash can be. And um, so just thank you for trusting in us en enough to come sit down with us and share your, some of your story. I feel like we need like several more of these to unpack yeah. it all, but. There's a lot, like it, it, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, and, and I'm grateful to be working with you guys. And, you know, you guys have been a powerful force, like getting this type of stuff out, you know, cause I'm only one person, you know, and it's just, it, it, it has been difficult mentally um, and emotionally like talking out about it, but I know karmically like, I'm doing the right thing. Like I, I haven't been able to just not say anything over the years, like after witnessing everything, you know, I've all, I've almost felt like this gonzo journalist, like being a part of the story, like, you know, like sort of seeing what things are like and then taking all the information and realizing, oh, wow, like I, I have to speak out about yeah. this because people just don't have the awareness. And I also just don't, I, I want to protect other young people like navigating through life and just being a voice of reason and just promoting awareness that, hey, like maybe you should think twice about making these type of decisions because it can really affect your life forever. And some people aren't maybe as strong as I am, you know, to get through it and it can ruin lives, totally. you know, and also the people consuming it, like maybe think twice about what you're doing because it's, it's not a healthy outlet and it's really creating this warped perspective on sex. And like, I just can't sit back and not say something about it. So yeah, you know, thank you for allowing me to talk about this. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, look at us and they're like, well, you guys are just a bunch of religious, blah. So I have a faith, but it's my humanity <laughs> that yeah. fuels and compels me. Of course, like my faith is also like very important to me, but I like as a human, I can't just, I, I can't be a bystander to this kind of horrible, horrific injustice and not say anything. And, um, but you know, for you, like, you just are an independent, autonomous person who is like using your voice to highlight this, these issues based on your own experiences. And I think it's extremely valuable. And I plead with people to just show you a lot of love and respect and support for what you are doing. It's very important. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you for having me. I, of course. Yeah. 
a pleasure. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exoduscry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.